Right now, something impossible is unfolding across California. A river in the sky, wider than the state itself, is drowning Southern California in its wettest Christmas since records began. Four people are dead. Over 100 rescues have been completed. Entire mountain towns are buried under feet of mud. But this is not just another winter storm. What makes these floods different? Why are homes melting into the earth with almost no warning? And what invisible scars from last year are turning ordinary rain into a weapon? The atmospheric river that slammed into California on December 24, 2025, was no ordinary storm system. According to the National Weather Service, rainfall rates exceeded one inch per hour across Los Angeles, San Bernardino, and Ventura counties. Downtown Los Angeles shattered its wettest Christmas Eve Christmas Day record, a mark that had stood since 1971. Some mountain communities received between 4 and 8 inches in just 24 hours. The Pacific Ocean delivered a month's worth of water in three days. What's making this worse is invisible. Governor Gavin Newsom declared states of emergency in six counties as the deluge intensified. More than 12 million people found themselves under a rare level 3 of 4 flooding risk from the Weather Prediction Center. These high-risk events occur on fewer than 4% of days per year, yet they account for over 80% of all flood-related damage and 36% of flood-related deaths. Interstate 5 near Burbank Airport vanished beneath churning brown water. Sections of Highway 2 and State Route 138 simply washed away, leaving gaping voids where asphalt once connected communities to the outside world. Then came the deaths. A Sacramento County deputy, 19-year veteran James Caravallo, lost control on a rain-slicked roadway while driving to work. His vehicle struck a power pole. A San Diego man was killed by a falling tree. In Los Angeles County, a body was recovered from a partially submerged vehicle near flooded terrain that rescue teams couldn't even see from the road. The fatality count climbed to four as helicopters plucked residents from rooftops and swift water teams waded into churning drainage channels. But something deeper is happening beneath this catastrophe. Atmospheric rivers are not new to California. NOAA scientists have tracked these phenomena for decades. They describe them as long, narrow bands of concentrated water vapor flowing through the sky, transporting moisture from warm tropical oceans to higher latitudes. The average atmospheric river carries water vapor equivalent to the flow at the mouth of the Mississippi River. Exceptionally strong systems, like the one that struck California this Christmas, can transport up to 15 times that amount. These ribbons of moisture typically stretch more than 1,200 miles long, but remain less than 400 miles wide. They flow about 1.8 miles above the surface, invisible to anyone standing below until the moment they make landfall. When that humid tropical air encounters California's mountains, the winds force it upward. The air cools, moisture condenses, and torrential rain begins. According to research from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, atmospheric rivers account for 30 to 50 percent of annual precipitation across West Coast states. They are essential to California's water supply. They refill reservoirs. They build Sierra Nevada snowpack. But when they strike in rapid succession, or when they collide with landscapes already compromised, they transform from lifeline to executioner. The difference this time is fire. In 2024, California burned. The bridge fire scorched over 50,000 acres in Los Angeles County. The airport fire consumed landscape across Orange County. Wrightwood, a mountain community in the San Gabriel Mountains, watched as flames stripped vegetation from hillsides that had held soil in place for generations. Those fires created something scientists call burn scars. And burn scars changed everything. When wildfires burn intensely or for extended periods, they transform soil structure at a molecular level. Heat from the flames causes organic material to break down and form a hydrophobic layer, a coating that repels water like wax on pavement. 
According to the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, this water-repellent barrier can persist for years after flames are extinguished. Rainfall that would normally soak into healthy soil now sheets across the surface, gathering speed and volume as it races downhill. The numbers are unforgiving. Cal OES reports that debris flows require only about half an inch of rain per hour on recently burned slopes to trigger catastrophic movement. On unburned terrain, it might take sustained storms and saturated ground to produce similar results. On burn scars, destruction can begin within minutes. The soil has nowhere to absorb the water. Plant roots that once anchored hillsides are gone. What remains is a slurry waiting to happen. Research from the University of Arizona, cited by the USGS, found that the return period for debris flow initiating rainfall increases from about one year immediately after a fire to more than 10 years after four seasons of vegetation regrowth. In Wrightwood, the vegetation had not returned, the soil had not healed, and when the atmospheric river arrived, the mountain simply let go. What happened next was biblical. Wrightwood sits about 80 miles northeast of Los Angeles, nestled in the San Gabriel Mountains at an elevation where winter typically brings snow, not flooding. Residents had watched the bridge fire tear through their forests in 2024. They had cleared ash from their yards. They had waited for rain to wash away the char. When the atmospheric river arrived on December 24, 2025, it delivered more than anyone could have imagined. San Bernardino County Fire Department crews reported rescuing multiple people trapped in vehicles as mud and debris rushed down roads leading into town. Video footage showed fast-moving slurries of water, rock, soil, and vegetation cascading through streets. Another clip captured churning brown water surging through the front porches of homes, carrying everything in its path. Cars disappeared beneath feet of mud. Entire structures became encased in debris. The San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department issued shelter-in-place orders. Highway 2, the primary route into Wrightwood, was declared impassable. Residents who had ignored evacuation warnings found themselves cut off from the outside world, surrounded by landscapes that no longer resembled home. Some neighborhoods were buried so deeply that rescue teams needed helicopters to extract people from rooftops. And this was just one town. Dylan Brown, his wife, and their 14-month-old daughter had rented a cabin in Wrightwood for the holiday. They arrived expecting snow and mountain quiet. Instead, they woke on December 24th to the sound of boulders grinding down the hillside above them. By morning, roads leading off the mountain were blocked by rocks and debris. The route to the grocery store was gone. They had almost no food. Diapers would run out in about a day. Brown posted a desperate plea in a local Facebook group. We're stranded. We have a baby. We need help. The message reached neighbors who were also trapped but still had supplies. Within an hour, people Brown had never met arrived at his cabin. They brought bread, vegetables, milk, diapers, and wipes. Enough to ride out the storm. Enough to survive until the roads reopened, if they ever would. But debris flows were not the only threat. Interstate 5, one of California's primary north-south arteries, closed near Burbank Airport when floodwaters overwhelmed drainage systems and turned lanes into rivers. Caltrans deployed 2,500 personnel and 1,253 pieces of equipment, including snowplows, backhoes, and storm drain clearing machinery. It was not enough. Sections of roadway remained submerged for hours, traffic diverted, supply chains stalled, emergency vehicles struggled to reach communities in need. Power infrastructure began to fail. More than 100,000 customers across California lost electricity as wind gusts exceeding 60 miles per hour snapped lines and toppled trees. Southern California Edison reported nearly 3,000 customers still in the dark days after the storm's peak. With some areas inaccessible due to flooding and debris, restoration timelines stretched into uncertainty. Line trucks supported precariously damaged poles while repair crews waited for conditions to improve. At Los Angeles International Airport, 520 flights were delayed and 52 were canceled on December 26 alone. This occurred during one of the busiest travel weeks of the year, stranding thousands of passengers who had hoped to reunite with family or escape the state before conditions worsened. 
Santa Barbara Airport shut down entirely when floodwaters inundated the airfield, departures stopped, arrivals diverted, the skies above California became as chaotic as the ground below. Water systems buckled under the strain, pumps required electricity to function, without power, water pressure dropped, treatment facilities struggled. In some communities, residents were warned that interruptions could begin within 12 hours of a blackout. Mobile networks flickered as cell towers lost backup power. Pharmacies closed. The infrastructure that modern life depends on revealed its fragility. And the atmospheric river was not finished. Forecasters warned that additional rounds of rain would arrive on December 26th and 27th. Another one to three inches was expected, less than in previous days, but still enough to trigger further debris flows on already saturated and compromised slopes. The Weather Prediction Center issued a level two of four flooding risk for more than 18 million people across Southern California. The ground could not absorb more water. The burn scars could not heal. The danger remained immediate and real. But why is this happening now? Climate scientists have been tracking changes in atmospheric river behavior for years. According to research from Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, even if extratropical cyclones do not significantly change their intensity or pattern due to climate change, increased moisture in the atmosphere will lead to more intense atmospheric rivers and more extreme precipitation events. Warmer air holds more water vapor. Warmer oceans evaporate more moisture. The fundamental physics of the system is shifting. NOAA satellite observations confirm that atmospheric river frequency and intensity have increased in recent years. The January 2023 parade of nine consecutive atmospheric rivers that struck California delivered over 32 trillion gallons of water to the state. The San Francisco Bay Area experienced its wettest three-week period in 161 years. California's Geological Survey mapped more than 700 landslides from that single event alone. 21 people died. Over 1,400 rescues were completed. Now, less than two years later, California faces another onslaught. Scientists are uncertain about precise long-term trends. Climate models vary substantially in their projections of annual precipitation across California, primarily because of differences in how they represent atmospheric rivers. Some models suggest a future with more intense but less frequent events. Others predict both increased frequency and intensity. The Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes at UC San Diego is working to identify which models best capture the physics of these systems, but consensus remains elusive. What is clear is this. The margin for error is shrinking. Forecast-Informed Reservoir Operations, or FIRO, represents one attempt to manage the dual threat of too much water and too little. The concept involves using improved atmospheric river forecasts to adjust reservoir levels in advance of storms, releasing water early to create flood storage capacity while ensuring enough remains for drought periods. But FIRO requires accurate predictions days or even weeks ahead. It requires trust in models that are still being refined. It requires decisions made under uncertainty with lives and infrastructure at stake. Debris flow risk assessment presents another challenge. According to the California Department of Water Resources, scientists are working to improve understanding of what combination of weather and post-fire hydrologic conditions trigger debris flows. Rainfall intensity matters. Burn severity matters. Slope angle, soil type, vegetation loss, and time since fire all factor into the equation. Yet predicting exactly when and where a hillside will collapse remains beyond current capabilities. The USGS Emergency Assessments of Post-Fire Debris Flow Hazards provide probability maps for burned watersheds, classifying basins as low, moderate, or high risk based on fire characteristics and terrain. These maps guide evacuation orders and emergency response planning, but they are not guarantees. Debris flows can occur in areas marked as low risk. They can bypass zones expected to be most vulnerable. They are, in the words of the National Weather Service, fast and unpredictable. Forecasters face another limitation, the timing of these storms. 
the atmospheric river that struck California on Christmas 2025, arrived during one of the busiest travel periods of the year. Evacuation orders competed with holiday plans. Some residents, already exhausted from previous disasters, chose to stay home despite warnings. Los Angeles Police Department Chief Jim McDonald pleaded with those in burn scar areas to reconsider. The threat posed by this storm is real and imminent, he said. If you decide to stay in your home in an evacuated area, it could be difficult to leave once the storm begins. Many stayed anyway. Some survived. Some required helicopter rescues from rooftops. Some, like the man found dead in the partially submerged vehicle near flooded terrain, did not. The Los Angeles County Fire Department reported rescuing over 100 people during the height of the storm. Swift water teams responded to at least five calls of individuals swept into the Los Angeles River or connecting washes. Each rescue represented a life saved. Each also represented someone who underestimated the danger or had no way to escape. The cascading nature of these disasters complicates response. When roads wash out, emergency vehicles cannot reach affected areas. When power fails, communication systems go dark. When water treatment stops, public health risks emerge. When supply chains stall, food and medicine become scarce. Each failure amplifies the next, creating a web of interconnected vulnerabilities that no single agency can address alone. California has experience with atmospheric rivers. The state has drought contingency plans. It has flood control infrastructure. It has emergency response protocols refined over decades. What it does not have is a landscape that can withstand the combination of intensifying storms and widespread burn scars. The soil does not care about preparedness. The hillsides do not respect evacuation orders. When the atmospheric river meets the burn scar, physics takes over, and the science is still catching up. Over four people have died in California since December 21, 2025, from weather-related incidents. Downtown Los Angeles recorded its wettest Christmas in over 50 years. Wrightwood and surrounding mountain communities remain partially buried under mud and debris, with some residents still cut off from outside assistance. Interstate 5, Highway 2, and State Route 138 suffered significant damage, with repair timelines uncertain. More than 100 rescues were completed across the state as swift water teams worked around the clock. What remains unknown is how much worse this will become. Another atmospheric river is forecast to arrive on New Year's Day 2026. The ground is still saturated. The burn scars are still exposed. The debris basins are already full. If the next storm matches the intensity of what just passed, California could face cascading failures that dwarf what has occurred so far. Scientists know that atmospheric rivers are intensifying. They know that burn scars create deadly vulnerabilities. They know that infrastructure designed for historical rainfall patterns may not withstand the new normal. What they cannot yet predict with certainty is when the next catastrophic convergence will occur or which communities will bear the cost. In a world where rivers fall from the sky and fire prepares the ground for flood, one question looms above all others. How many more storms can California survive before the scars become permanent?